Hello and welcome to the New York Film Academy Hour. I'm Joel Smith and I'm so excited because we have an amazing guest for you guys today. His name is Ken Lerner and if you don't know the name, you'll definitely know the face. Excuse me, I'll have to do some reading because he has a lot of credits. He's performed in film classics The Running Man, The Fabulous Baker Boys, and Unlawful Entry. He is perhaps best known for his roles as Principal Bob Flutie on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, Rocco Berufi on Unhappy Days, and Attorney Jonathan Saunders on Chicago Hope. Uh, he's done incredible performances from Laverne and Shirley, Chips, Carnegie, and Lace, uh, Lacey, excuse me, The 18, Twilight Zone, Family Ties, Hill Street Blues, The Facts of Life, Golden Girls, L.A. Law, Beverly Hills 90210, Jag, The Practice, The Drew Carey Show, Will and Grace, Ally McBeal, Touched by an Angel, E.R. Friends, Scrubs, Two and a Half Men, Weeds, American Crime Story, The O.J. Simpson Story, Castle, The Big Bang Theory, Desperate Housewives, Grace and Frankie, Silicon Valley, and just this past week he's done This Is Us and Feud. I'm so excited. Stay tuned. We're going to talk to Ken Lerner. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. Come over here. Come in. So for those of you listening, we are playing Ken Lerner's reel, starting with his classic role on Happy Days. How are you doing, Ken? Good. That was one of my first jobs. The hair was black at that time. Welcome to Sunnydale. A clean slate, Buffy. That's what you oh get God. here. So classic. I can't even. <laughs> yeah, hyena kids did me in. <laughs> I take pills it is an epic death, though. Water. What do you mean? Water in your legs or to make you urinate? Hytrin. Help me pee for a while, but it's worse now. Ow. That hurts? You bet. I could die. This is a great episode. Yeah, I had to find out I was dying about 9, 10, 12 times. So many takes. Yeah. Especially for TV, right? Yeah. You cannot sue the city. Perhaps you'd feel more comfortable the first episode of Castle. To your attorney. What are you kidding? And Snow Crab. Friends. And King Crab. This is like Isha Tyler, too. I mean, the people watching this show loved it so much. It's just, it was the most exciting show I've been on since Happy Days in terms of the response. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. It had that kind of uh, timeless effect to it. I feel like in 30 years, people will still be watching Friends just like they're watching Absolutely, Happy Days. Absolutely, sure. Would you like to begin with some couples counseling? Congressman Marino is here. Yeah, Mr. President-elect. Jim. Lobbying reforms. You know, we hardly could get through this. You Jimmy Smith was cracking up. <laughs> <laughs> there could be an issue with the DCCC. I do cartwheels on the roster. Now, <laughs> now were, you, were you cracking up, Jimmy? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the dialogue and the way we were doing it worked James, really nice. I love it. This is one of my favorite episodes of Scrubs like ever. Time. Now, this was the first time the Scrubs people were in front of an audience because they went from single camera to three camera in a studio. So were you kind of the veteran on that then? I'm oh, sure. Live. I've done loads of three camera. A lot of them was first time. Amazing. This is, of course, Weeds, nice famous first episode. Oh, thank you. I've been out and I do play Jews. <laughs> I am, actually. Grace, Grace and Frankie. Sliders. They're amazing. But it's Frankie that's hungry. We'll Lily and Jane were just sliders. great. Quail, please. Can I get you another flight? No, no, no. I'll, I'll get I feel like it's rare to see long-lasting yeah, friendships yeah, like that in Hollywood and be able to come back and back to them again. Oh, you could nice. see how much they loved each other. Oh. It was incredible. We have them in Silicon Valley. Very dangerous. Wait, where are you going? We need to oh, advice to Big Head. Ad libs by no T.J. Miller, and this, so you just had to try to keep up and figure out when to jump in. I hear he's incredibly gifted and, and fun. Yeah. Our son Jeremy is still racking up huge wireless bills overseas. You guys don't remember the Catch Jeremy so campaign high, thing that you're too young to and you need to go <laughs> back and watch. It was only about three years ago or something. And this is you. We did 11 episodes of this, 11, 11 uh, commercials. Stop using your phone. <laughs> such a genius ad. Oh my goodness. What an amazing reel. Thank you so much for sharing that oh, with us. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to give you a chance. Uh, you guys, this is Ken Lerner. This is the first time you're seeing his face. because you just Well, you've seen the reel, but now here he hi, is hi, in hi. person. Um, thank you so much for being here with sure. us. I really appreciate it. Um, Ken is an instructor at NYFA and, uh, as you can see, all-around amazing actor. I just want to dive in real quick. We always start with the same first question, which is, when did you know you were in love with movies? Um, very early on. Um, my brother is an actor, and so he would take me. The first movie that he took me to was a horror movie called Diabolique, which <laughs> a, a dead body jumps up from the bathtub, and I had nightmares 
from it for years and years and years. Scary movie. But you know what's incredible? This is our 10th episode, and every single person starts with a horror story. Really? With a horror film. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a really uh, a testament to what horror brings to the film genre and also how it kind of captivates us. Yeah, and it stays in your, yeah, it stays in your brain. Absolutely. Yeah. So you grew up in Brooklyn, correct? Brooklyn, Bensonhurst. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you were there with your brother. He's also an actor. Were you guys putting on plays in your living room? Uh, no, he was doing, um, he was, he's seven years older than me. Ha, ha, ha. And uh, he was um, acting in plays and, and doing stuff at Brooklyn College. And then I was watching him and I, I could do that. And then I started doing uh, in high school and then in college, at Brooklyn College, I followed him. And so he went out to L.A. and uh, eventually I followed. So... Yeah, but you know the Brooklyn accent was a little bit of a problem when I first came out because I was talking like this. But isn't that what landed you the job at Happy Days? At Happy Days, yeah. And then after that, I realized I if I didn't want to play anyone but a mook, <laughs> I gotta try to level it off a little bit. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. You you're watching horror movies. Are you doing school plays to start acting? Did some plays in high school. They had in my high school Lafayette high school in Brooklyn, they had this thing called Sing. So we would all put on this, uh, we wrote it, we put it on, and we sang. And um, that's where I got the first taste, and it, you know, followed me. Yeah. Did you come out to L.A., you followed your brother, did you, like, have an agent already? Were you just audition like, no, cold auditioning? No, just came out, and the first uh, week I came out here, I got the lead in an AFI movie called Hot Tomorrows, that Marty Breast directed. Marty directed Scent of a Woman and um, uh, the, well, the big problem with his career was Gili. Oh, that, that, yes. That destroyed his career. But he did the Eddie Murphy movie um, with Beverly Hills Cop. So, yeah, so that was my first um, experience. And it's wow. like, I went from the star of this AFI film that went to the New York Film Festival, won awards, and then immediately did Happy Days. I thought it was the easiest town in the world. <laughs> so, was, uh, you know, just landing here and all of a sudden working like crazy. It was great. Did the other actors give you, uh, maybe give you some, some uh, back talk for that, for, for having such an easy glide yeah, into it? Yeah, people couldn't believe that I was working so fast from uh, just coming out from New York. Well, at that time, there weren't, I mean, there were actors from New York out here, but that was the time when Jews could play Italians. But then it changed because then there was this big influx of actors from New York coming out to L.A., and uh, then you started playing exactly who you were if you were a character actor. Copy, so, copy. Yeah. And you wanted to break from that. How long? What, what did you do to try to break your um, dialect? Uh, just really, really worked on it. Tried to enunciate a little bit better because when you're in a New Yorker and you're from a heavy Brooklyn, Bensonhurst, you just don't open your mouth and you talk like this and everything is fast and you can't even uh, imagine how you could talk even more better. And then, <laughs> then things started clearing. I studied with Stella Adler, the Stella oh Adler. Oh my gosh. And so she kind of beat it out of everybody. Wait, I, you need, know. I need stories. I've never been in the presence of someone who's worked directly with Stella Adler. No. And I did my um, thesis on her when I was in acting school because wow. I was just amazed at what she what she could communicate through a page even. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine working with her in person. Yeah, well, her, her big thing was text analysis. So she had a class where you just, uh, we were doing Men in White, and um, uh, you would bring in the screenplay, she would be in the front, and she would um, break down almost every word, and people were like hanging on what she had to say in terms of honoring the writer and figuring out what the material is about and like that. And then, um, so I studied with her for two years. It took her intensive class. I remember a few things. One, uh, somebody was doing a play where they were talking to God, and uh, Stella stopped them, stopped the girl. She said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm talking to God, Stella. And Stella said, you don't talk to God like that. And she took the girl <laughs> and she just, she started shaking her and dragging her. And the girl is crying and crying and crying. And Stella said, now talk to God. And she said, God. And Stella said, that's acting. Sca wow. Scared the shit out of me, let me tell you. Wow. So, mm-hmm. Great acting teachers, uh, uh, in my experience anyway, kind of rattle your sense of who you are. It, it's, it's jarring to be so shaken from from your 
natural reactions to start becoming someone else in front of a person, especially as they're not even giving you direction, but just kind of pushing you. She wanted to break barriers. I mean, I when I did the uh, gentleman caller from Glass Menagerie, that was one of my first scenes. So it calls for the actor to be chewing gum, and he talks about, do you want some gum? So I started the scene. I'm chewing gum, and of course I had my New York accent, and I'm playing the scene, and uh, I maybe got out three lines. I had, you know, five page scene memorized. She said, "What are you doing?" I, said, you know, that's how she always said, "What are you doing?" And I said, um, "I'm, I'm uh, talking to um, the girl, and you know, trying to impress her." And she said, what, what, "Why do you have gum in, your, gum in your mouth?" I said, "Well, it calls for that. You haven't earned the right to have gum in your mouth." And what are you wearing? Well, I'm wearing jeans. Um, no, no one wears jeans in my class, so we couldn't. No one could wear jeans. Wow. And you had to dress you know, appropriately. And Stella was very, very big on going to museums and looking at paintings and just analyzing the time frame. We had two or three classes where we walked around like kings and princes. Wow. And here I'm this guy from New York, Brooklyn, that didn't know. And I had to stand up straight and really show my power and, you know, feel it. She was great. She was, you know, just so, wonderful. So can't even imagine, like a literal legend. Yeah. That's amazing. So talk about getting the role on Happy Days. How does that come about? Um, they were looking for a tough guy who, and I don't know how they chose me, <laughs> uh, who was Italian. I don't know how they chose me. And But the big point was, was that Henry, Henry Winkler, was probably 29 playing 17 or 18. And so they couldn't surround him with somebody his age. So they had to surround him with somebody that kind of looked like they were younger, because I always had a baby face. And so it worked me playing off of him. And then those were the days where you did one part, and then they called you back, and you did the same show, another part, like two or three yeah, weeks later. Yeah, I was going to say, you like three or four so roles man, on I did there. three or four roles. And my big one was the Malachi Brothers with Demolition Derby with Pinky Tuscadero. That was fun, because I was in a demolition car, and the other people driving the cars weren't actors, they were stuntmen. So their job was to scare the hell out of the act, and they came smashing and barreling into the car. Wow. It was great, it was real, you know, real fun. That sounds like uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, talk about filming in front of a live audience. How was, does that change the dynamic for actors? Well, it's an immediate feedback. And as I said before, the um, Happy Days was the biggest hit show on television, so the audience was like so primed and so ready for everything. And um, then the only other experience I had with that was like Friends. I mean, I've done loads and loads of three camera sitcoms, but Friends, the audience was kind of the same. Um, when you do sitcoms in front of an audience, the big thing is the producers will change lines if because they, they see immediately what lines got big laughs, what didn't, so they'll change it. I just did a sitcom about three weeks ago, Marlon Wayans has a new sitcom yeah. called Marlon. So I did his sitcom, and that was in front of an audience. Wow, incredible. Yeah. Um, okay, so then I want to talk a little bit about, okay, you're settled, you're acting, you've done Happy Days, but then you kind of have this stunning, like, endless run of guest spots. Um, we've had a couple of actors who've done guest roles on here before, and they often talk about uh, trying to find the rhythm of the cast and making mm -hmm. sure, like, that you're supporting what they do. Do you do any research before you go on to a show that where you're not a principal player? And what does that research look like? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important for actors to know the tone, of, if it's a comedy, to know the tone of the comedy. There's a difference between Frasier and Happy Days and um, between Two and a Half Men and other, like, and Scrubs. So you, what I always do is I watch the show and I see what the rhythm is of the show. And then... Um, understand that if it's a show where you can improvise and see other people improvising you jump in if it's a show where everything is right to the word you know that's what it's going to be so it's like you do your homework you 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 watch a couple of episodes you see what they're doing and you see how you fit in and as a guest actor your job is to support and that's what i've been able to do and uh you know i play um doctors and lawyers and things like that but i've also played um bank robbers and cops and child molester i once was at a bank and one of my parts on a tv show called the commish yeah remember that so i'm on the bank and a woman is behind me and she hits me hard on the shoulder and i turn around I said, what's going on she said you're a child molester i said no no 
I was so you watched the commission was on this week yeah and you were so convincing that <laughs> So, it could only you know, be true. No way you... you're that good of an actor. <laughs> right. Wow. That, uh, the liberty some people will yeah. just take yeah. forgetting that this oh, is all pretend. You know, when they, they, you know, with me, a lot of people know my face and they don't mm -hmm. know the name. So the usual thing is, did you run the liquor store on my, <laughs> in Ohio? I said, no, I'm an actor. No, 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 no. Did you, you know, and so it's one of those until they know your name. You know, which yeah. is happening more. Well, that's nice. That's uh, I can't even imagine that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about developing your craft. Mm -hmm. Um, you study with Stella. After that, you know, once you're kind, I don't, once you're done with school, or once you kind of feel like you've graduated, what do you do to keep yourself in like a peak acting shape? I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, when I came out here, there was a fabulous teacher named Roy London. And Roy was a playwright in New York and then came out here and he was working with Brad Pitt and Susan Sarandon and lots and lots of people. And um, so I took acting classes with him and uh, it was a scene class and Sharon Stone was one of the people in the class and other people, uh, I mean, just great actors. And uh, Roy was a brilliant teacher and that's how I think actors have to keep themselves sharp. And the great thing with Roy was... Um, I kept studying with him and studying with him, and then he finally saw that I was getting a lot of jobs, and he said, my people are studying, but they're not working. Would you like to teach an audition class? And that's how I started my teaching career. Wow. You know, for Roy. And so I had lots, and these, so I had this strange position of being in an acting class doing scenes, and then teaching the same people who were in the scene class how to audition. And then finally I realized I can't do both, so I dropped out of scene and <laughs> just did auditions. But you got to stay sharp. I mean, I did a lot of plays and, um, you know, in between. So you just got to, you got to practice your craft, you know? Absolutely. Um, while you are uh, teaching, okay, here's what I ask. When you're teaching, do you think you can teach comedy? Is that a thing you can teach to a student? Or is that something um, you have to come with already? You know, it's a, a weird combination. You got to have good timing. You got to have good instincts. It can be taught specifically on a script, but um, I don't know. You know, you, it, it, either you got the chops or you don't got the chops. A lot of people have it, don't even know they do. And um, then it's, I mean, you know, and there's really a formula. There's, um, you know, learning how to do the rhythm in threes, knowing that there's no breath before um, a take, meaning somebody says something and you come right in. So those are things that you can teach, but if you have that knowledge already, it's much better. And again, people pick up on it. People pick up on if you're funny or not. You know? When did you realize you were funny? Well, you just from birth. I was, I was, I wanted to get out and do comedy you know, <laughs> the second I got out. But I mean, I've been lucky enough that I do comedy and drama. But um, you know, loads and loads and loads of sitcoms and working. You know, and you have really great directors in L.A. and people telling you where the jokes are, and then you really realize it. And um, you know, it's a real kind of um, collaborative effort. And if you're working with, you know, James Burroughs, you're working yeah. with. Uh, uh, Jerry Paris, who directed my Happy Days, you know you're working with incredible people. So I want to bring up the Running Man clip mm -hmm. because I feel like your brand of comedy is so specific. Let's take a quick look. Sure. Known or unknown. Sign here. Here, here, here. Use my back, victim. <laughs> <laughs> Does he work? I love you! Don't forget to send me a copy. <laughs> you know what the scariest thing about that scene was? Mm. They had a wooden plate uh, over my shoulder in the back, and Arnold, who's like, you know, superhuman, yeah. um, when he took the pen and stabbed it in the back, my only worry was it was going to go through the wood and into my back, oh my and then I wouldn't have to act. Yeah. But it's a one-shot deal. But it worked fine, but it was scary. And, you know, Arnold's like this, I mean, he was the governor, and he's like this big little baby, you know, always <laughs> joking around and smoke, blowing smoke in your face and, you know, um, doing stuff like that, you know. 
Definitely. Yeah. I feel like that scene works for a couple of reasons. One is just the the cut from when you say turn around and they cut to the slightly wider angle and you just feel so vulnerable in the frame. You're like up in front and you're like, why would you turn your back to like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Because of course we as the audience know what he's capable of. Mm -hmm. And then it's so unexpected for it to be just a pen stab. Again, from someone that we've seen, you know, with bazookas and turning into the Terminator for just to be stabbing the pen. And then I was reading the comments on the YouTube because that clip is something like, I think like 14,000 hits or something like that. And underneath someone's like, the fact that he just barely reacts. And I feel like that mm -hmm. is a current through a lot of your work where the reaction is so subdued and makes it that much funnier to the audience. Is that something that is consciously happening or is it something that just naturally comes to you? Well, I mean, I think it's, it, it depends on the part and the situation, but a lot of the times there's an old expression, less is more. And so you realize that, and uh, the timing, if it really calls, I'm always trying to explore that moment of trying to be as real as possible with that little funny edge, if it's there. But I think you have to play the reality. If you start playing the anticipation or playing um, knowing it's going to come, the audience can see through it. So you Let's know. take another look at the Snickers commercial. And that less is more idea, I feel like, resonates so loud to me here. Because if you look at it the first time, it looks like you're not doing anything. There's so much work here. Okay, let me do it again. Like e, L, looks like a cow. Okay, just letters. <laughs> e, L, looks like a small cow. No, uh, there are no cows. Okay, let me, let me do it again. Is it a mammal? No. Not going anywhere for a while? Something with fur? No. Grab a Snickers, because nothing handles your hunger better. It's uh, one of those turny things that you keep in the drawer with a handle. Can opener? Yeah. No. Hungry? <laughs> Why wait? <laughs> so you know what the problem with that shot was? <laughs> um, I wanted to do it that way, where you could barely hear me. Mm. And the sound guy went to the director and said, I can't hear him, I can't hear him, what's going on? <laughs> and the director said, hear him, figure out a way so that I could do it that low and that kind of, if you want to call it subtle. But, I mean, it really kind of played into it because I'm right next to him. Mm -hmm. And the absurdity of what we're talking about, if it was played totally deadpan, I think works really nicely. It it really, it to me, it's funny. I, I just really, I love the, because it's like the eye twitches. I feel like if, my natural is you'd be like, roll my eyes a lot and be like, oh my God, is this guy an idiot? But your reaction of just like, just let him go. Yep. <laughs> just let him see, figure it out yeah. himself. And it's you know, it's, it's interesting when you're playing a, um, like an eye doctor or you're playing a lawyer, these characters have done it a billion times, meaning a lawyer has been a lawyer for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So it's not the first time. So it's always... As an optometrist, I've probably had people in the chair that were guessing at what was going on. So nothing rattles you, supposedly, because you've done it a lot, you know. I like that. Getting into the, the history and the backstory of the character, how much research and backstory are you doing for characters when you get into it? Is it a lot? I mean, we saw from your reel that you're doing like a lot of patients, a lot of lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you're just kind of drawing on the same experiences over and over again? Well, that and also, I mean, when I was younger, I did really a lot of research calling up hospitals and if I was playing a heroin addict or if I was playing a doctor who's delivering a baby, I would call or I even went with a to a friend who's um, optometry, op, op, uh, obstetrician and um, watched and I... I asked cops if I could drive, do a drive around. They said no, but uh, <laughs> but I tried. I did a, um, I played a, uh, an army uh, guy who was at um, what was it, Project X, and I went out to uh, an Air Force base, and I just sat there and watched the guy who was writing people in and seeing what he did, because you can pick up things, yeah. and so you do your research. Again, that's what I advise my students, you know. So take me into a classroom of yours. Stella had very strict rules. Do you have a lot of strict rules about your classroom? No, I'm much, much, much more lenient. <laughs> what I expect, though, is I expect people to really be sponges mm -hmm. and to um, respect the process and understand that I have stuff to give them because I've been through it. So when I'm talking, cell phones are a huge problem nowadays. Mm -hmm. And you just got to stop the cell phones and you got to get their attention. Kids don't pay attention as much anymore. So you really just got them to just focus 
and to see what we're talking about. And I teach a lot of business of acting, so I am uh, really wanting my students to go out there and work. So in the business of acting class, we're doing lots of auditions. So I'm giving them stuff from TV and film, and uh, the expectation is that they try to get a call back. And I'm like dangling that carrot, because they can't get a job from me. It's just the experience. But as the classes go on, the material gets harder, and the work needs to deepen, and they need to be prepared, just as if it's a professional audition. Talk to me about what you're seeing in the actors like the early, the fresh actors, um, pretty bad habits. I know my acting instructor was like, if you don't stop those shifty feet, mm -hmm. plant them, set them, and let's move on. Mm -hmm. Is that is that still an issue for oh, kids that are coming through? Yeah. <laughs> Happens all the time. I, I say sometimes that people are walking on eggshells because they're supposed to leave and they just take <laughs> little, little steps. They're also um, watching people and they're doing this when they're talking and I'm saying stop dancing stand still I watch my early work and some of it I had a habit of leaning in like this and then I realized oh remember Stella and coming mm -hmm. back up and just you know making that work but people have early habits and um, you know as a good acting teacher I think it's important to see what people what you can fix and just let them know that's not going to work for you also, I think it's really important for people to figure out what they play mm. and then to really understand this is my this is my niche. I want to play those roles, do them, nail them, and then I can move on and play hunchbacks and play kings and you know, but in that little whatever because LA and TV and film, they want to categorize you. They want to stereotype you. I'm not saying you want to be stereotyped, but you want to work. So the important thing is is to be able to nail those roles, I call them bread and butter roles. Mm -hmm. Nail those roles and then move on. I had a friend when she first moved out here who kept getting the advice of you need to go blonde because nobody wants a redhead <laughs> in the lead. Yeah. And her perspective was if I'm unique, maybe they will remember me mm -hmm. and, and cast me. And I know this is a lot, like poor actors I feel like have maybe the worst end of the job as just as far as getting in the door because there isn't a lot of feedback whereas if you're a camera guy you know you've got all these grips and people around mm -hmm. you if you're a director the whole world will tell you if you're bad but if you're an actor i feel like people it's it's a lot of wishy-washy you're getting a lot of different things especially even when it just comes to the headshots mm -hmm. of just what is the look i'm trying to sell how do you advise your students to narrow that down it's a very simple process oh you ready yes be yourself oh that's what people want because you're unique so don't try to be like anyone else. Bring your special quality to what you do. And eventually your talent and your appeal and the reason why people are attracted to you, if you can bring that out in your work, that's what makes people work. So it's a simple equation, meaning you're coming in and you're you and bring you in because nobody else is you, but it's very difficult to do because people want to perform. They want to act what the what the film and television is looking for is reality is looking for real moments and who can be more real than you bring than you bringing your soul to your work and that's what i'm looking for to get from people you know? what advice do you have about casting directors you need to get to know them their assistants like uh, i know i know a lot of basic rules are like send the thank you notes mm -hmm. afterwards but what is a good what should an actor's relationship to casting directors be? Right. Well, it's a business. It, it, it's it's called show business, you know. So the business aspect of it is you always remember who you met, you always remember how they treated you, how your experience was with them. You, um, I wasn't a big note sender, but I think it's a good thing to do. I think nowadays because everyone is um, on the internet, so you're not sending your pictures, you're sending emails. And um, we had to go and drop stuff off. Now you don't do any of that. But um, it's important to have a list of the people that you've met and follow up. And if you're doing a play, send them a note, send them a postcard or an email. Whether they respond or not, you're keeping in touch with them. And casting directors, their job is to know actors. So the more you're in front of them, the more you're trying to connect to them, the better it is. And remember, casting directors want you to be good. They're not our adversaries. They're our advocates. They want you to get the job. Why? Because then they can move on to the next part that they want to cast. 
So sometimes actors, I, I don't like it when actors come in and say that they thought the casting director ruined their audition. Because casting directors don't ruin your auditions. Casting director's job is to just say the lines and get it out there, and then they're watching you. And you're reacting to what you should be getting. And again, bringing your wonderful qualities in. If you do that, you work. I've heard a lot of acting friends recently say, when they're saying like, oh, the casting director in my audition, a lot of times they're referring to the fact that the casting director was on their phone while they were in their mm. audition. Is there a way, like, I feel like a lot of times I would, like my acting teachers were like, no excuses. If you have a distraction, you got to work through it. Mm -hmm. You never know what's going to happen. And I was in the I theater have a, I, have a, I have a great story. Yes. I was reading for a lead in a horror movie at a small independent company and a casting director I'd never met before. And the producer is sitting there, the director is sitting there, and the casting director is reading with me. And the casting director is yawning after every line that they oh, give me. Oh, goodness. Yawning after every line. So we went through about maybe three quarters of a page, and I said, could you please stop yawning when you're doing this? And they thought I said the next line, and they went to their next line and yawned. And so... Obviously, they weren't listening to me. They weren't responding to me. They weren't even there for me. And I said, okay, I have to stop. And the producer said, oh, yes, yeah, no, no, okay. And the casting director looked at me like they wanted to kill me. But I had to protect myself in that situation. And I felt it was the right thing to do. Of course, I never saw that casting director again. Yeah. But it was a, you know, not a, casting, not a major casting director. If it was a major casting director, they wouldn't have done that. What I find is the really good casting directors are there for you. And if they're going to be rude by eating, who knows what happened that day. If they're a mm. really good casting director, I don't think they do that. Copy. You know? Good to know. So protect yourself and your time, but, you know, be aware of the situation. And it is a business at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, there's a lot of talking in this industry. People will know your reputation yeah, before they exactly. know you, unfortunately. Yeah. I want to circle back a little bit away from teaching and a little more into some of your more current work because you were on some amazing shows. This Is Us is like having a phenomenal breakout yeah, first year, show. and you just appeared on that. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Well, I worked with um, Justin. Um, the good-looking Mammy Manny guy, yes. and so I was playing a uh, the head critic of the New York Times, and it was a wonderful scene between me and him because it was really um, him coming wanting me to do something for him, and me not respecting him because he was the Manny, and he also didn't show up on opening night. Uh, spoiler alert. And it was on already, so it's okay. It's like three uh, weeks old, guys. Right. <laughs> so um, it was a real nice give and take, and they did it all handheld. Ooh. So there was handheld here, and it was two cameras. So it was handheld in this way, handheld behind me, and we just shot just everything that way. And we just um, kind of did five, six, seven takes, and we moved on. And the interesting thing is I had a lot more to do on the show, but... It, everything else that was in there was me really putting him down. And I guess the powers that be watching it went, he put him down enough. I think we can <laughs> We've move sold on. this moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so certainly didn't want to have me just, you know, ragging on him and ragging on him. So You were also on American, uh, oh my gosh, American Crime Story. A uh, feud. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How is that? What is like working on that, which is... is that, did that just well, that's Ryan, it premiered Yeah, it just premiered. It premiered yeah. last Sunday. Um, and it's Ryan Murphy, who I did the O.J. Simpson. Yes. Yeah, I played um, uh, the first lawyer that O.J. Simpson had, who he fired. And um, so my scenes are in, in this feud was with Jessica Lang. Amazing, And she amazing. was fabulous. And she wanted to rehearse, and, she, and we went back and forth and did it. And um, Ryan Murphy, who's the director of the first episode I did um, for Feud was right there, very simple direction, and allowed the actor to expand on what he was doing, and we found a nice rhythm there, and I just couldn't be happier. And watching it, I was very pleased. I'm, I'm critical of watching myself, and I liked what happened. And I have another really, really good episode coming up. I think it might be the sixth episode. And Jessica... Um, I don't want to give anything away, but, <laughs> but she is just great. I mean, there's a reason why she's such a big powerhouse actress and Academy Award winner and all that. You know? Yeah, a friend of ours was an extra in Grace and Frankie, the 
when she's buying liquor at a bar and she was like she made sure that i ate and she wanted to make mm. sure that you know I, if i needed to run my lines more um and i think that from an a-lister that's kind of incredible mm -hmm. uh, and then of course ryan murphy who has this kind of crazy weird uh span of stuff he's able to do from scream queens to glee and then to american horror story um yeah and then american crime story on top of mm -hmm. it like he's it, it's just incredible uh do you prefer working in genre like that in a very kind of specific i know the direction or but you've also done sitcoms so i guess it doesn't really matter well i mean i've been lucky enough to cross over to do comedy and drama and when you're working with someone like ryan murphy who you know knows what he's talking about. Again, you come on to the set and you listen to his direction. And when you're working with big stars, which I've been able to, uh, I worked with George C. Scott and um, who do you, George C. Scott, I don't know if anybody knows who he is, but he is a fabulous, he was Patton. And um, when you work with great actors, you really, really, really should pick up on stuff of what they did. When I was working with George C. Scott on Exorcist Three. Um, we had a scene where he had to come in and see his best friend's body in like 12 uh, big bottles. His, oh he was destroyed and blood and tissue in 12 bottles by a maniac. And um, he's supposed to yell at me. And so we started the rehearsal and George said, I'm not going to yell at him. And the director said, but George, you need to, um, you know, get him out of there. And he said, trust me. And so... The big thing about George was he would be off to the side talking and we would be talking about his career and everything. And they said, okay, ready to go. And he was right there. And what he did was this incredible look. He walked in, saw the, the bottles of his friend, and, and then he just turned around, didn't say anything. And I said, excuse me, what are you doing here? And he started shaking, like so angry that I interrupted him that all I could do was be in the moment and go... Okay. And I had other lines, but it was like, okay. And I scurried off and it was, it's a wonderful scene. And, um, the point is, is that if you do your homework, George was ready and prepared. So it was all right there for him, you know? So when you work with stars, um, there's a reason why they're stars, right. you know, they have the confidence and they have, and they're doing the work. And like I said, everybody stars are actors. So it's an actor with an actor. So you get over the fact it's Jessica Lang. It's Jessica Lang playing Joan Crawford. I'm playing her agent. Let's do the scene. So it's just like doing scene work when you're in NIFA or when you're anywhere. It's actor with actor. So you got to get rid of that. You know, you admire the star, but once the camera's rolling, it's an actor with an actor and you make it happen. I feel like that is the best lesson we're going to get for today. Thank you so much, Ken Lerner, for being with us today. You bestowed so much wisdom. I feel I feel refreshed and like ready to take on the world anew. Uh, that's great. This is amazing. You're wonderful. You have a really wonderful quality about you. <laughs> thank you. you. It's like you enjoy what you're doing. I, I really do. It's yeah. great conversations. Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us here at the New York Film Academy Hour. Come back next week when we have Jessica Oyello coming in to talk about her latest work. I'm so excited to speak with her. Um, we're here every Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, we'll see you guys soon. Bye. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, Christian Harloff, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit PopcornTalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.